So we're going to get right into Galatians. And really, Galatians is, uh, Paul is really has, you ever play a note and you just play the same note over and over and over again? That's kind of what he's doing. He's saying the same thing over and over in the first three verses, but he's making a point. So we're going to dive right in. Um, Look at verse number one uh, through three. He says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child and does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father, even so we were children were in bondage under the elements of the world. So the word child right there, the idea is that is is of a minor. It doesn't say a suggested age or anything like that, but we know he's not talking about someone that's legally an adult. And in the both in the Jewish and the Greek cultures, um, they were definite of a coming of age. They had a ceremony for the boys um, and when they stopped being a child they st- and started to become men, um, they had legal rights to the heir. So um, in the Roman customs, there was no specific age when the son became a man. So it happened when the father thought the boy was ready. So when Paul is saying in this phrase, until the appointed time by the father, that's what he's talking about. It shows that he's shows that he has that Roman coming of age custom in his mind when he, and not the Jewish custom. That's what he's talking about. There was in the, in the Roman customs, when a boy or a girl became of age, the boy would offer up his ball and the girl would offer up her doll and, um, and they would give this to Apollo and, um, and then that would mean that they were giving up childish things and then they would be appointed or be heirs. That's kind of how it is. But now they go into the next verse Verse number five, look at the liberation of the heirs from their bondage. This is what he says. He says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as son. Now, let's break that down a little bit. It says, the idea behind this is the fullness of time meaning that at this particular time, the time was right. The time was perfect. Remember, when Jesus came, the time was right. God came with a redemptive plan, and it was perfect when he came into the world. He was prepared to do God's work. So that's, that's, they're saying this in the fullness of time, that the time was perfect. And then he said, God sent forth his son born of a woman. So Jesus came not only as God's son, but he also came born of a woman, born under the law. So hang in there with me, okay? The internal son of God in heaven added humanity to his deity and became a man born of woman and born under the law. Then it says that we might receive the adoption as sons. So it would have been nice just if God would have came down and purchased us from the slave market, right? But not only did that, God's work for us didn't end there. What he did, he elevated us in a place. He elevated us as sons and daughters. So we became adopted into the family. That's what he's saying. So what do you do when you're adopted in the family? You celebrate, right? So look at verse number six and seven. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I love this part because you got to remember in this time, in this culture, you couldn't just say Abba Father as a Gentile. That was not accepted at all. But what he's saying here, Paul is saying that right now we're all accepted. It's fitting that those that he would send his son to come into our hearts, the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And this gives us a right, the ability to cry out and say, Father, Daddy, he belongs to all of us now, right? So God sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts. So we know that we're sons and daughters of God by the witness of the Holy Spirit within us. 
And Paul wrote in Romans 8.16 that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Love that part. Now, let's not miss something right here. Probably went over our head. But let's not miss the truth of the Trinity that's woven in that text. It said, God the Father sends God the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of God the Son. Did you catch that? It's all woven in there. In our hearts, he gives us the insurance that we are sons and daughters of God. So he says, therefore, no more slave, but sons. Sons are not slaves, and uh, slaves are not sons. And remember, Jesus used that illustration of the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son story? When the father came back, the son was coming back as a slave, but the father refused. He said, no, I will only receive you as my son. So there's a beautiful progression for us. Beautiful. First, that we're set free from slavery. That's number one. And then we're declared sons, and then we're adopted into the family. So then the sons are made heirs. So what do we get as heirs? He told us in that verse, he says, we inherit God himself. That's what he's saying. So we become heirs of this. Now listen, after that, we have a decision to make. What's the decision? Look at verse number 8 through 11. Our decision is, is a choice that's between living under the elements of the world or the Son of God. So it says this, but then indeed, when you did not listen carefully, church, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. Little g, right? But now, after you've known God, or rather, are known by God, how is it, he's asking them a question, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? And then he tells them, you, you observe the days and the months and the seasons and the years, and he says, I'm afraid for you guys. At least I've labored for you in vain. Now, the bondage is natural. It's natural when we don't know God. We're, 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 we're trapped in there. But he's telling the Galatians people, he said, you guys knew. You guys knew God, and still you're going backwards. This is what he's telling them. But here's the part that's so important. You guys know the scariest verse in the Bible. What he was saying here, he said, or rather are known by God. See, it's important that we know God, you guys. It is super, super important that we know God because we have the good news and we can share it. It's important for us to hear God's voice. When we're praying and we, get, we can be obedient, it's so important that we know God. But it's more important that God knows you. It is more important that God knows you in a sense that that relationship that we have, that accepting, that's what he wants. He wants to know us. So I'm going to show you guys something. Look at Matthew 7, 21 and 23. This is the terrible words of judgment in there. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of our Father who is in heaven will enter Next verse. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, cast out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. And then I will declare that I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The scariest verse right there. Didn't I do everything? So Paul's telling the Galatians people, they're thinking it's by works. They're thinking we have to do something. We have a checklist. And it's not. And I, I, I think about that in my own walk with Christ because that would be scary, right? I come to church. I worship. I pray. I've casted out demons in your name. And he says, depart from me. But I want you to watch this video. Give me four minutes, right? Watch this video, and then I'm going to come back and conclude on this section of it. Check this out. It's over now. 
There's no more purpose for my lungs, cause I'm not breathing. If I thought that I was still alive, then I think I was dreaming. I just left the earth. My soul escaped my body now. I'm dead. And I'm rising into the heavens to find out what lies ahead. This life is over. And my time is done on earth. There's no more stressing. I'm about to meet the one that gave me all my life and blessings. Now it's time to hear his voice. And it's time to feel his embrace. And it's that time to meet my God. And now it's time to see his face. I'm at the gate. And I don't want to wait. I want to see my savior. I'm going to feel his presence. Have his safety and bed. In his favor, wait. They open up the gates, and sunlight dances through the entrance. If I was alive, I'd pass out from the beauty of his presence. I can sense him all around me. I can feel him every place. He's here. I feel it, but that's not enough. I want to see his face. They close the gate as I walk in. Now any memories are useless. Any earthly love is worthless, because no other can produce this. So much color, so much light. Life and wind and sun and love and music, so much happiness. God loves us and this paradise can prove it. Oh, where's he at though? I just want to see his face. I'll be around it. And I'm walking on the streets of gold, but I ain't getting my crown yet. Wait, I feel something. I turn around and I catch eyes with his. And I've never seen him before, but I still know who it is. Right now, I'm face to face with Jesus, looking God right in the eye. Immediately I bowed, and if I was alive, I would have cried. Now God was always right beside me, but I see him. I can touch him. I'll exhort him. I'm going to praise and magnify him because I love him. And I tell him, you're my king. This happiness cannot be doubled. You're my rock, my life, my ever-present help in times of trouble. And I love you. God, I love you. For eternity I show you. But he looks me in the eye, and then he whispers, do I know you? know me. Yeah, you made me. I was in church every service. But he tells me church without applying what you learned is worthless. But I was a choir member. I prayed through with poems and acting. But he says he checked the book of life and that my name was Axon. And I'm laughing like there must be a mistake. I just won't hear it. Then he says I praised him, but I didn't have him in my spirit. I can't bear it. Little thought I gave you praise wholeheartedly. But then he turns his head away. And then he says, depart from me. I start to scream, but it's too late. Immediately I feel the flame and I'm ashamed. It's me to blame. I could have Stopped all of his pain. Life ended like this for me. This ain't how I wanted to conclude. Uh, that's why in real life it won't be. But don't let this be your future. You may go to church, but man, you gotta live it. Don't be two faced. Don't be hypocrites, guys. Don't be dogs and ladies. Don't be loose days. We ain't got no time. So right now, drop the gangs and lift your hands and let them in before it ends. Let's praise them while we have the chance. When I saw that, I was thinking, wow, everything that we think we're doing right, you guys, we can't play church. You got to have God in your heart. It's not just a matter of checking a box off. It's not just a matter of coming in and said, I did this. So our friends are saying like, oh, you know, you went to church today. Or I did this. I prayed for them. Because God looks at the heart. God is looking at the heart. So we don't have that right, the heart right. Those are the scariest words ever. You see how excited that young man was? He was like, I know, I can feel this presence. I'm walking on the streets of gold. And he's like, who are you? I can tell you when I lost my job back in 2009, and I was tied into four or five different church, I was making a lot of money. And I remember working a security job, making $14 an hour after making 100000 a year. And I was walking down this corridor, and I said, Lord, what happened? And this is what I heard. Who are you? I knew right then and there things had to change. But look at me now. <laughs> look at me now, because God is like, he can do it, but we got we to gotta surrender everything, and we got to give it to him. Here's the thing I want you guys to leave with. Listen to this. Many people are looking for step-by-step -step for salvation. 
people get the idea that we need a manual for salvation. In Islam, they, they have this five pillars, right? And according to them, if you obey the five pillars in those steps, you will get your salvation. Many Christians make that mistake of presenting salvation as a result of step-by-step -step process. Roman Catholicism has seven sacraments. Various Christian denominations include baptisms and public confession and turning from your sins and speaking in tongues as steps of your salvation. It's not written in the Bible, you guys. It's not what he said. The Bible presents one step for salvation. When the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul responded, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's in Acts 16, 30, 31. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only step to salvation, you guys. So don't be fooled, run away. If they're giving you this list of things to do for you to be saved, I would be heading for the hills. That's not what the word says. In John 3, 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. God took human form, died in our place, taking the punishment that we deserve, and then he did everything. So it's not by our works, right? It's not by our works. God promises forgiveness for our sins and eternal life. You can see it all over scripture in John. Look at John 1.12 and 3.16 and 5.24. Look at those scriptures. So here's what I would tell you. Salvation is not certain steps that we must follow to earn salvation. Yes, Christians should be baptized. Yes, Christians should publicly confess the gospel and Christ as our Savior. Yes, you should, Christians should turn from our sins. Yes, Christians should not commit their lives to disobeying God. It should be obeying God. However, these are not steps to salvation. These are results of your salvation. Amen? Because of our sin, we cannot earn our salvation. God requires one step. Receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and trust in him and him alone. That's what he requires. So all this goobly gobbly steps to do this, and I understand because we're wired that way. If you think about it, we, we work, we have to clock in, right? We get an evaluation, we got a checklist. Some of you guys are maybe truck drivers, you got inventory to do. We live our mind off a of check, check, check. And what gives us gratification is when we complete everything on a checklist, right? We say, oh, I got everything done, and we feel satisfied. And somehow we try to include that into our Christian walk. We're trying to do a check mark, like I did everything. I got a picture of a guy that was born in the 1700s. His name was John Wesley. Do we have that picture? This is John Wesley. They didn't have iPhones back there, so we had to use this portrait. But John Wesley, he was a son of a clergyman, and he was a clergyman himself, and he was orthodox in belief. He was faithful in morality, and he had full good works. He did ministry in prison. He worked in sweatshops. He worked in the slums. He gave out food, clothing. He educated some of the lower income kids in the, in the slums. He observed both Saturday and Sunday as a Sabbath day. He sailed from England all the way to the American uh, colonies as a missionary. He studied his Bible. He prayed, he fasted, and he gave regularly. And you know what he said? Yet all that time, he was bound and changed by his own religious effort. Everything that, that Mr. Wesley was doing was for him to get God's favor. He was doing those works, which is great. Missionary trips, all this stuff. But he was doing it so he would earn God. You ever get that feeling? This is how the devil speaks to us. The devil speaks to us in a, in a way where you're like, man, you know what, Lord, if I, if I, if I do this the right way, then, then maybe at work you'll give me some favor. If I do this the wrong way, then I'm going to be guilty and so I'm, I'm going to be punished. I remember when I first became a pastor and I was like, 
I got to, today, I got to speak today. So I got to do everything right today. I got to get up in the morning. I got to pray. I got to do this. I was feeling like I had to do something for the Holy Spirit to anoint the word because I know the enemy wants to have a try at me to get me to stumble, to trip and fall. But that's not the case. That's not what it is. That's me trying to, to work. This is what Wesley was doing. But he said this at the end. He said, looking back on all his religious activities, he was truly saved when he said, I had even then the faith of a service, though not that of a son. Once he became born again and he realized that it wasn't all the works that he was doing and he became a man of God, but that was powerful. That was in the 1700s. So look at what Paul does as we pick up the story in verse number 12. Paul now is making this appeal. He says, brothers, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. Now, let's stop right there. Paul was not saying, look at me, I'm perfect. That's not what he was saying. He was simply wanting them to follow the love and the, thing, the things that he had for Jesus Christ. And as Christians, we should be the same way. We have family members, co-workers that we want them to follow. Just look at my example. I'm not perfect, but I want to know, I want you to follow me so I can lead you to the person that we know is perfect, right? So as Christians, we should have the same thing. So this is kind of what Paul is saying. He's not saying that he's perfect. He's saying, imitate my consistency. Imitate my consistency. And he's trying to tell them that. Paul knew that the Galatian Christians should imitate his liberty because Paul was free in Jesus, and he wanted them to know the same freedom. In the same way, we should be like Paul. We should not be bound to any laws and any Jewish laws. In some sense, like I said, every Christian should be able to say to others, become like me. You know, I'll walk through the bowling alley, I'll walk through my fitness classes, and, and you ever have somebody say something like, it's something about you. There's something about, they can't quite put their finger on it, and every time is my moment to give Jesus credit. Like, you know what, it's the Lord, it's Jesus Christ, it's not me. I wanna give them all the credit because I want them to say one day, well done, my good and faithful servant. So Paul's appealing to them. Look at verse number 13 to 16. He says, you know that because of my physical infirmities, I preached the gospels to you at first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing? He's asking them again, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given it to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? How many of you guys feel like that when you're telling your friends and family about Jesus and you're telling them the truth and all of a sudden they're not your friends and they don't want to be family anymore. <laughs> but at some point they come back and they respect that, right? At some point, I know I've had closers in relationships like that where it didn't go like I thought, but at the end of the day, they reached back out to you and said, man, thank you for telling me that. I needed to hear that. I didn't want to hear it at the time, but, but thank you. He's asking them like, am I your enemy? And the physical infirmities, we don't know. It doesn't really say in Acts what that was. Apparently, Paul was compelled to travel to this region um, because of some type of physical infirmity. And uh, like I said, Acts doesn't tell us, but we do know that Paul was in the region of South Galatia, and uh, persecutors tried to execute him by stoning him in the city of Lystra. Uh, we saw that in Acts 19. And his attackers kind of gave him up for dead, but yet he miraculously survived. So some people think it was those injuries that caused, as he's talking about in this infirmities. Some scholars think he was under depression. Some think it was epilepsy. Some think he had an illness of a thorn that was in his side. Some thought because the altitude change that he was at, 3,600 feet down, that he got malaria. So we don't know what his physical ailment was, but I like the way... Uh, Morris quoted it. He said that this, the difficulty of diagnosing the case of a living patient should warn us of the futility of attempting um, for one of us that's, 
that's um, trying to diagnose what happened to a man that died 1,900 years ago. So there's no chance. We're probably not going to figure out what happened, but I like the way he put that. He's like, don't even try. But it, it, there was something going on because he mentioned it. Something was going on and what, what brought him there. And now he's telling them in verse number 17 and 18, beware of the affection the legalist has shown you. So they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. But it's good to be zealous in the good things always and not only when I'm present with you. I like that too because as I'm studying this, it's like it's easy to, to act a certain way around certain people, right? You automatically get this filter. I, I maybe I, one or two times since I've been at Valley, people come in and I've probably heard profanity inside the church one or two times, but most people will filter themselves, and they might cuss like a sailor out there, right? But when they come in, the house of the Lord or something around people, then all of a sudden they censor themselves. All of a sudden they're not the same way. And I look at that and I'm like, Paul admits that these, these legal people, and this is how cults actually start. Cults start, you guys, they call it love bombing. Love bombing. And they overwhelm these prospective members with attention, with support, and with affection. That's what they do. Once they got you, it's just to gain the membership. That's what they're getting. And Paul's kind of warning them, like, you guys are kind of going backwards right here. It's really a technique to gain members. Christians use the same technique in some way or another, love bombing, right? Paul is saying... The legalistic opponents wanted to draw these Galatian Christians away and create a divisive group. That's what they were trying to do. Doesn't that sound like the enemy? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, dividing us amongst each other. That's what it sounds like. So the zeal that's cultivated by legalism is often more zeal for the group itself, but not for Jesus Christ. It's a warning for us. As people are talking to you about the Word of God, you know, I, I love the Bible tells us to test us. Test us. You don't have to believe anything Pastor Jerry is saying, Pastor Russell, Pastor Doug, Pastor Test the Word of God. I know when we're in our meetings, we like, we're just going to tell the truth. Because if we stick to the Word of God and just stick to the truth, you can't go wrong. Just tell it like it is. My dad used to say, tell it like a T-I-Z. Tell it like it is. I said, okay, I'm going to tell it like it is then. So it's good to be zealous for good things, but if you're zealous for the bad things, it could be very, very dangerous. That's what he's saying. So Paul is telling them, I love you guys like a father. In verse number 19 and 20, this is what he's saying. He says, I love you guys like a father. He said, my little children for whom I've labored and birthed again until Christ is formed into you, I would like to present you with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. He's calling them my little children. Paul considered himself a father figure to the Galatians. Yet the challenge that he made made him feel like he needs to bring Jesus to them all over again. Kind of had to start from scratch. Because he says, for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. So Paul knew that the work of forming Christ in them was not complete until they stayed in the place of trusting Jesus. They had to stay there. They would get there, and then they slowly backpedal. That sounds like me, my first walk with Christ. When I first, I knew about the Bible. My grandmother took us to church. My mom, our church was actually on TV. They never took us in the building. But my mom and dad would turn on the TV at 8.30 in the morning. And that was my exposure to, to church when I was at home. And then we had some unfortunate situations happen where my family had to go to my grandmother's house in Indiana for a year. A year. And my grandmother went to church every single day. Every single day there was all kinds of stuff happening. And I was like, what is this? And they were teaching out of the King James Version, so Pastor Jerry didn't know what was going on. I was just a little kid playing underneath the seats and stuff. And I'm like, Tuesday, we're going back to church. Wednesday, we're going back to church. Thursday, we're going. I said, I don't like church. Not because I didn't like it, you guys. I didn't understand. I didn't understand what was going on. 
but lean not on your own understanding, right? When I got older and I started studying the word of God, then he revealed himself to me. And man, I wouldn't miss church for the world right now. Thank you, Grandma, <laughs> wherever, you, wherever you are. Um, but he's saying, my little children, Paul rightly considered himself to be a father. But here's a, here's a pattern that I saw. I'm gonna read this. It says, this is a pattern found in biblical ministry. The word of God falling on the lips of the apostles or ministers enters into the heart of the hearer. The Holy Ghost impregnates the word so it brings forth the fruit of faith. And in this manner, every Christian pastor is a spiritual father who forms Christ in the hearts of his hearers. Love that. Every Christian pastor who forms hearts of it in, the, in the ears of his hearers. Love that. So Paul is, is talking to them. He's saying the same thing that he said in verse three and two and one. He's just saying the same thing. Like, you guys, you're going backwards. And when we get to next next week, actually the week after that, because we have first Wednesday next week, we'll start to see him and in, in what he does in, in uh, verse number five, because he changes kind of his tune, right? But right now, he's on them. He's being tough on them. In verse number 21, he shows the system. He's showing, using the Old Testament to show that the system of grace and law can exist together um, as a principle in our lives. So in verse number 21, he appeals to those and he says this, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So now he's directly promoting or talking to those who are promoting legalism and he's calling out the people that succumb to legalism and he writes to those who desires to be under the law. He's living under the law, keeping all the basis for their relationship with God. And there's three things that's out, out there. It says, there are many advantages to being under the law. Do you know that? There's many advantages to being under the law. As your principles of relating to God, first, you always have outward certainty of a list of rules to keep, like I mentioned earlier. If you're under the law, it's so easy to say, okay, I did that. If the law said, go to church, pray, you got to face this way to do that. You have to drink this. You have to eat this and take this out of your diet. Then you can easily follow that. You go, yep, I did that. I did that. I did that. I did that. I'm good. Second, you can compliment yourself because you kept the rules better than anyone else. Right? When you're following the law, you can, like, you can compare notes. I can go over to my sister and say, well, did you do this, this, and this? You're like, yep. And I'm like, so did I. But I did this too, right? I did this one, or you did that one. And like, I can compare. So I'm always patting myself on the back. And then finally, you can take credit for your own salvation because you earned it and you're keeping this list of rules. So there's some advantages to following that because the devil just keeps you on this rule track and you say, yep, I did everything. Think now back to the video of the, of the young man. What was he saying? He said, I went to church. I did those things. He was counting his list. He was looking at everything that he did on that list and saying, man, I was, I was great. And still he heard those words. Depart from me. I never knew you. So there is no list. There is no list. God did everything for us. He died on one cross for all sins, right? Not a little cross for little sin, not a big cross for big sins. He died on one cross for all sins. And he said, now repent, follow me. That's all. He made it so simple. And in our mind, he, the devil wants to chain us. I saw an illustration that this pastor had a big old chain and he said, that if the devil could come in and just chain you up and say, look, this is what I'm going to do to you guys. I'm going to wrap you guys up, and I'm going to keep you in bondage, and I'm going to change you, and you're coming with me. He said, that's not what they, we would all run from that. We would be like, oh, I'm not doing that. But the devil doesn't do that. He takes one little link of the chain, and he starts handing it out to you and has you build your own chain and your own illustration. Then you trap yourself. So the devil is so cunning, he's like, I'm just going to give you one piece at a time. Want that promotion? Here you go. You're like, man, I can't work on Sundays anymore. I can't go to church. 
Want that? Here's another piece of the chain, and pretty soon you're just building your own chain around yourself and restricting yourself, limiting yourself under the law, right? Under the law, it is what you do for God that makes you right before him. Under, the, under grace, it is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and makes it right before him. Under the law, the focus is on my performance. Under grace, God is the focus and Jesus is what he's done on the cross for us is enough. Under law, we find fig leaves to cover our nakedness. And under grace, God, we receive a covering one through sacrifice that God provides. The Christian has no business living under the law. He came and he abolished that. So he is, this is what Paul is saying. Do you not hear the law? Paul sensed that he hadn't made his point. So now he approaches them in a matter with this illustration of the Old Testament. And essentially Paul said, let's have a little Bible study. So he's breaking open Genesis chapter 16. And Paul took it for granted that the readers already knew the Bible. So he's already going down this road. He's talking about Abraham and, and Sarah and Hagar in Genesis 16. But it's important that Paul referred to Scripture again and again. One of the things that I got from Africa, you guys, that I'm going to start immediately, is that these kids were reciting Scripture to us. They set us down, and they had a little play for us, and they would stand up, and they would say, John, 316, for God so loved the world. And they would just recite scripture. And then they go sit down, we clap, another group would come up, and they say another scripture. And they say another scripture. And on that long plane ride, I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell us? What is it I can bring back to the States? He said, number one, do not compare Africa to the United States. He said, I am the same God in Africa as I am in the United States, but my people have forgotten the power that I have. I want you to remind them, I'm the same God. I still heal the blind. I still can heal the deaf. I can, I, can, I can supply all of your needs. And he said, I want you to tell the kids, I want you to get scripture in the kids' hearts. So I'm like, I told my wife, I said, memory verses. That's what we're gonna start. We're gonna start memory verses in the skills. So I sent a text message to all my leaders last night. Give me some memory verses. What's the first one we can start in July? And boop, 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 boop. I'm getting verses. I'm like, okay, now we're gonna download these to the kids. So I'm telling you guys right now, Wednesday, July 9th, if you have a middle schooler or high schooler, we want them in the, uh, actually, it's gonna be the 16th, not the 9th, because I have to teach here, I think. It's going to be a Wednesday. I'll announce it. <laughs> but it'll be in a couple weeks that I want every single middle school and high schooler back there because I'm going to reveal some stuff to them. I'm going to show them the Word of God. I want to get the Word in them because that's their defense. That's their defense. They got to get the Word in them. So he shows us in verse number 22. In 23, let me speed this up. The Old Testament shows the contrast between the two sons, Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. Um, he says, I love this part. What does it say? For it is written. Where have we heard those words before? Remember Satan was tipped in Jesus? He said it is written, right? Paul saying the same thing right here. For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondswoman and the other by a free woman. But he who of the bondswoman was born according to the flesh, and he who of the free woman through the promise. Now, I won't go through that because I know we're running out of time here, but let me, let me go to verse number 24 through 27. This is the Old Testament shows the contrast between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. He said, which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, and Hagar is, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of all of us. For, again, church, it is written, rejoice or barren, 
you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. One thing to note in there, two covenants in the Bible, a covenant is a contract, a contract that sets the rules for our relationship with God. So Paul brought it right down to the issues confronting the Galatians Christians that legalists um, wanted them to relate, relate to God under one set of rules, and Paul wanted to relate to God under the rules that presented the gospel. That's what that means. And in verse number 28, uh, through 31, we'll end with this one. Paul applies the contrast between two systems. He says, now we brothers, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does, not, what does the scripture say? I love that. What does scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman, and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but we, but of, of the free. So basically what we're saying here, he says, now we, brethren, as Isaac's was our children, as Christians, we don't identify with Ishmael. We identify with Isaac. We identify with the promise of God. Right? Remember, if you know the story um, with Abraham, they, they were waiting patiently, but it took too long, so they, they made things happen themselves, and God wasn't pleased. But then he still fulfilled the, the promises with Isaac, so that's, who we, that's what he's saying, we're followers. Scripture says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. The answer to this problem is clear. It's not easy, but it's clear. Law and grace cannot live together as principles for a Christian life, all right? And then lastly, he says, brothers, we are not children of bondwomen, but we are free. So Paul, one of the great issues was freedom. He knew the bondage of trying to earn his own way before God, that he lived that way for decades, remember, because he persecuted Christians. Now he knew the freedom and living for the Son of God and free in Jesus Christ. So here's the point. Here's what I'll leave you with. Barclay makes the point that anyone, anyone who makes law central in a position of a slave, all his life is seeking to satisfy the master, and the master is the law. So anybody that's seeking to do that is a slave to the law. But when grace is central, the person that made love his dominant principle, it will be the power of love and not the constraint of law that keeps us right. And love always, always, always is more powerful than the law. Did you get something tonight? Amen. So I want you guys seriously in this moment right now, there may be that, I feel like there's something in your hearts that some of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, this is between you and the Lord, are riding the fence. And if, if the Lord were to come back right now, maybe you would be questioning yourself like that young man in the video. Because God knows everything about you. He knows everything in your heart. So if it's anything that's unclean, and this is, the, this is the beauty part. I'm not gonna be doom and gloom. The beauty part is that we're all still have air in our lungs and able to breathe, right? That means we can repent. That means we can accept Christ in our life. That means we can make an bow face and start following the King of Kings. Because like Pastor Ron showed this, this illustration with that rope, it's only this much time on earth. We got eternity that we have to deal with. So I want to be on that eternity ship, right? So if you don't know the Lord like that, I want everybody to bow their heads. This is the moment with you and God. And all I want you to do is slip your hand in the air. If you feel like I'm backsliding, if you feel like I'm not, this, even this week or this month or this past year, I haven't been really walking right with the Lord. 
then let's get back on track. So raise your hand. Say, Pastor, I just want to know who I'm praying for. I'm not going to have you stand up in anything. And let's get back on track. Say this in your heart. Father God, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I want to be a follower of you. I don't want to hear depart from me. I want to hear well done, my faithful servant. So Lord, show me. Show me the errors of my ways. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again. And Lord, from this day forward, when I leave him, I'm not the same person that walked in. You spoke to me tonight, Lord. You've forgiven me for my sins. And now I want to walk with you. Show me how to do that, Father. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Would you stand and worship? God bless you guys.